Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a familiar face from her memorable roles in movies such as The Happiest Millionaire, Airplane, and Diamonds, and of course, from her recurring roles on The Bill Cosby Show, Weird Science, and as Gavin McLeod's wife, Marie Slaughter, on The Mary Tyler Moore Show. She guest starred in dozens of TV shows, including Perry Mason, Bonanza, My Three Sons, and The Facts of Life. She was also a frequent panelist on many popular game shows, including Match Game, Chain Reaction, and Password Plus. She's written a fascinating and insightful memoir entitled My Four Hollywood Husbands, detailing not only the excitement of having the great Helen Hayes as a mother-in-law and being married to the man who produced such iconic TV shows as I Love Lucy and Bewitched, but more importantly, she chronicles her own tumultuous spiritual journey of codependency in being an unwitting enabler to several spouses who were either abusive or alcoholics or both. She received a Theatre World Award for her performance in Whisper to Me, and she's a renowned humanitarian, having been a longtime advocate for child abuse prevention, as well as serving as Executive Vice President of the National Dyslexia Research Foundation. It's my great pleasure to welcome Joyce Bullifant to our show. Joyce, thank you so much for joining us. Well, I think it's so nice of you to invite me. Joyce, it's clear from your book that you've had a most unusual life. Your childhood was very unstable and you even lived in foster homes. You've had a successful show business career and you've been part of the Hollywood inner circle and you've had a number of turbulent marriages. What made you decide to write this book? Well, it's funny. It started off 24 years ago and I was right, started writing it and it was called Home Sweet Home, Where Is It? because I had lived in so many different places. And I thought, where is that home that's going to be okay? And I wrote and wrote and wrote. And then a friend of mine said, many years later, I hadn't finished the book. He said, I have the title for your book. And I said, what is it? He said, my four Hollywood husbands. I said, Bruce, that's disgusting. <laughs> I would never, ever title my book that. And it, it's just not, that's not what it's about. And, and then I, I said, but thank you. And I hung up and a couple of weeks later, I thought, yeah, but it, it might sell books. And maybe I'd be able to help people by talking about codependency and alcoholism and use the background of the golden years of Hollywood. and that the fact that you can be in a very bad situation, but you can get help and you, and you can go on. Well, before we get into your marriages, I want to ask you about your career. I first remember seeing you as Rosemary, the flirtatious roommate of Leslie Ann Warren in The Happiest Millionaire, which was Walt Disney's last movie. Can you share some memories of working with Walt Disney? Well, I adored Walt Disney, and I could never call him Walt or Uncle Walt. I always called him Mr. Disney. And the day that I was going to the studio to record by Yum Pum Pum, the name of the song I danced to in that, I was so nervous. My gosh, it was going to be a huge orchestra. And, and I'm an actress who sings. I'm not a singer. I'm an actress who sings a role. And as I was walking to the studio, Mr. Disney came out of his office, walked down the path, put his arm around me, and he said, I have big plans for you, little lady. And then he died. Oh. <laughs> That's not a good thing. <laughs> but it was, he was so sweet, and he sent flowers, and he sent notes the day that I came to start shooting. And he said, I know you've been coming to the studio a couple of weeks before you were due to. And I was working out with the dancers because I wanted to be prepared, you know? So I, I came in under the radar, I thought, but nothing got by Mr. Disney. <laughs> That's amazing. Can you imagine what your career might've been like if he had lived? Well, that plus, of missing being Mrs. Brady on the Brady Bunch. <laughs> oh, we're going to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> there are too, many, too many of those things. But, you know, I've had a wonderful career. I've been very fortunate and I'm still going at it and I adore it. And I've just been very, very fortunate. So I have no regrets. 
Although you've co-starred in dozens of TV shows, you're probably most remembered for playing Marie, the wife of Gavin McLeod on the Mary Tyler Moore show. Did you get to know Mary and the other cast members very well? Well, yes, I did. I got to know Betty really well and my dear sweet Betty. And uh, Gavin and I are very good friends and we live near each other here in the desert and his wife, Patty, and I are in touch. And Mary was a little bit more not quite as warm with me as the other cast members and Valerie was wonderful and Cloris was always there. I mean, it was, it was a great cast and all due thank you to the writers. My gosh, they were good writers. Now, as you mentioned, I'm going to get to that now. Many people may not know that you were originally supposed to be the star of The Brady Bunch, but the network chose Florence Henderson at the last minute. That must have been extremely upsetting. Well, it was confusing because I didn't know that NBC, um, excuse me, ABC in New York had a final say. I thought I was cast. I was wardrobe. The little girls were cast to look like me. I'd signed a contract. And I'm showing the director and the, the writer, Sherwood Schwartz, I'm showing them the clothes she wears. And they were very quiet. <laughs> I, I came over and I said, what, is something wrong? And they said, sit down, Joyce. All of a sudden, Florence Henderson has, Henderson has become available. And Marty Starger, the president of ABC in New York, would like her to play Mrs. Brady. She, they think you're too young. And they were really working and we were really trying to get you to do it because we wrote it for her to be funny and for the housekeeper to be the straight person. And if they have Florence does it, the housekeeper is going to be the funny person and Florence will be the straight person. And we just have, we're fighting like heck for you. And I said, that's so sweet. And then that night, instead of calling and telling me that I couldn't do it, Sherwood came to the house to tell me, which was very unusual and very sweet. But it wasn't, it was a blow, but it, that's show business. I mean, you go on and she was wonderful. It turned out just great for everybody. And I went on to do a lot of other shows. So it, it wasn't that bad. Well, isn't it fascinating that after marrying William Asher, you ended up living in a real Brady Bunch with a blended family of eight children. Yes, there were a lot of children and we had a lot of fun. We really did. You starred in The Unsinkable Molly Brown in Kansas City and you wrote that you really identified with the role of Molly Brown. Why? Well, I, she was a scrapper kind of in, I don't know that I was a scrapper in my makeup I was, you know, I wanted to be okay. And I'm dyslexic and she has sings the song, I'm gonna learn to read and write. And I thought, boy, oh, it just identified with the character. And I love the music and I was thrilled when I finally got to do it. And she was a survivor and so are you. Yeah, I think maybe that was it. Is Molly Brown your favorite role of all the roles you've played? Yes, it is. <laughs> I got to sing and dance and wear fun costumes and had a great script. I did it for three months during the summer. And it was even, uh, they wanted to extend the run, but I'm a mama first and I had to get the children back to school and get them ready. So they had to bring someone else in to replace me. And it broke my heart, but the cast was so sweet. The night that I was my last performance, there's a scene where Molly is in Paris and people are giving her gifts. And instead of what they, the props that they usually gave, they brought me real roses and they brought me some sherry that was a sweet sherry that I like instead of the champagne. They bought me all the things that they know that I like. It was very touching. Oh, that's so sweet. Okay, Joyce, I wanna ask you about your famous marriages. Your first husband was actor James MacArthur, who's best remembered from Hawaii Five-O. He was the adopted son of Helen Hayes, who was the first lady of the American theater. He was an alcoholic and a bully, and at times even sadistic, and he was unfaithful. I was astonished to read that Helen Hayes told you not to marry her son because he wasn't good enough for you. So why did you go ahead and marry him? 
I loved him. <laughs> and I met him when I was 14 in a boarding school. I hated putting that in the book about what Helen said. And I, I, she kept saying things about Jimmy that weren't nice and it would really hurt. But, and, but I really, and they were very close. And after the divorce, they became closer. And I, I realized she was in a marriage, an alcoholic marriage to Charles MacArthur, the famous playwright. And, and she loved him very much and she suffered because of it. And Helen and I were really very close. I loved her dearly and learned so much from her, not about theater, but about life. And she, she was trying to save me from, from that. And she even said one day we were picking roses in a rose garden in Nyack. And she said, if you ever have any problems with Jimmy and your marriage, you must never come to me. And I mean, all these kind of like, don't do this and, and this isn't good. And it confused me. And until I wrote the book and was talking to the editor one day about it, I said, I hate putting this in. She said, but it's very important. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, like a light bulb, I said, she was trying to protect me. It wasn't that she didn't love Jimmy, but she knew he had problems. And she and I were very close. She was trying to protect you, Joyce. It's really clear. And uh, your close relationship with Helen Hayes lasted much longer than the marriage. You were close with her long after the divorce from her son. But she was obviously a complicated woman. For example, when you got the lead role in a Broadway play called The Paisley Convertible, and you told Helen Hayes that you got the part, her reaction was very negative, even though she spent her whole life on Broadway. Why do you think she reacted that way? I think, again, she wanted to protect the marriage. You know, once I, I was in it, she wanted to protect me. And she had done that with her family. And I think she felt uh, guilty and sad sometimes that she left Jimmy. And I think that's what she was worried about. But, oh, boy, what a reaction. It was, uh, it was on my birthday, and I was so excited to tell her, uh, I got the lead in a Broadway play, Mom. And she said, how dare you? And I was like, what? She said, how dare you go off and leave your children and your husband? And, and again, I think she was looking at me as if I was her and wanted me not to make mistakes that she made. It, it was a, an incredibly close and loving and complicated relationship. You obviously had a lot of love for Helen Hayes because you wrote and starred in a one woman show called Remembering Helen Hayes with Love. What yeah. was it about her that was so special? Well, she was a down to earth person and she told naughty jokes, I love that. <laughs> and she took me on my first trip to Europe and we, we just, we're very close. There was some connection there that I don't know, even know how to explain it. Your second husband was another actor, Edward Mallory, who starred in Days of Our Lives. He was also a verbally abusive alcoholic. Why do you think that after suffering the way you did in your marriage to Jimmy, you were once again drawn to another alcoholic? There's something... You put me in a room with a hundred people and one alcoholic and I just go to him like a magnet, I think. What? There's something very sensitive and, and maybe I get a sense of, of hurt. And here's my ego. This is where you get in trouble is I thought that they didn't feel loved enough and appreciated. And if I love them and I took care of them, uh, they'll be fine. They won't drink. Well, that's wrong. And also, I was very codependent. You know, I, w I wasn't doing anything to say, you have to stop drinking. And Ed wasn't really abusive in, in a way like Jimmy was. He, he had demons of his own. He had a, a very dark side and he was a tortured soul. Well, it, it was heartbreaking to read about that marriage in the book because of what you had already suffered when you met him. Yeah, but, but 
each, I guess each time is a lesson to you finally get it. I don't know. Well, your third husband was a true Hollywood legend, William Asher, who produced and directed many iconic TV shows, including I Love Lucy, Bewitched, The Flying Nun, Our Miss Brooks, The Danny Thomas Show, The Patty Duke Show, and many, many more. You married him after knowing him only three months. Why the rush? He came on like gangbusters. And he was, he was funny. He, he just didn't stop. He just pushed that romance. Like he was full of romance. And it was, I thought for a moment, I thought, you know, maybe this is right. Maybe this is the person who will take care of me for a change. I didn't see anything that was, would block our, our marriage. And, and he pretended to love children when he didn't, my children. But in the book, you find out about what happened there. He ended up being a great father and a wonderful, wonderful husband. I, I adored him and respected him. And it was only after he became ill and he started abusing alcohol and, and medication. And, and that by then, I had learned not to be a codependent person. I, I, so I said one day to him, you know, if you get help, I will stay and be with you the rest of your life. But I can't live, you know, picking you up when you fall down, rushing you to the hospital. It's making me, it was making me sick. The co-alcoholic becomes sick along with the alcoholic. And, and I had learned enough by then. That was a very difficult leaving. And I never wanted to get divorced from Bill. I, I wanted to stay married. Well, very soon after you married Bill Asher, he asked you to sign a contract giving you no financial rights to his property. You said that you signed the contract because you wanted him to know that you married him for love, not money. I think, Joyce, you raised a really good point about why prenups are really problematic where there's a financial imbalance between the spouses. For the one with less money, it's really a no-win situation, isn't it? If you sign it, you get nothing if you break up. If you, if you refuse to sign it, you're perceived as only being after his money. Well, the thing that happened with that was that we had, or he had, he had found this dream home of mine a big English tutor home, which was a dream home of mine. And he said, if I buy that, will you marry me? And I thought, well, I said, get out of town, you know, don't be silly. And he bought it, but he said he was buying it. It, it was for both of us, it was joint. Every, he said, everything I have is yours, you know? And so I went into the marriage believing that. So what all the money that I had I put into that home, redecorating it from top to bottom. I used all of my money and didn't, I thought it was going into jointly living together. And I did that with, with Ed when he didn't have the money I had. I put his name in the house. I just thought you did that. I thought if you married you, at least your home was together. But then there were all these papers. This was after, way after we were married to sign these papers. And it was a, a bit of a shock, but I didn't argue, I, I just signed them. But it, it, it hurt because I had three children and suddenly I had no money, no home, no nothing. And it wasn't until later when I was offered a job, a very good paying job as a designer. And I said, I have to take this. And he said, no, you're an actress, you act. I said, I don't have anything in my name. If you decide to run off with some young chick, I have three children and nothing. And so he, he put the house in my name. And so, so I wouldn't take the job. Well, I think for people who are confronted with the prospect of a prenup or a marriage contract, in your case, because you were asked to sign it after you got married, they really should read your book because it's an excellent red flag about what to do if you're the one without the money. Yes, you have to protect yourself in some way. You really do. And, and especially if you have children. Well, I thought it was really interesting that during your marriage to Bill Asher, you were offered a really good job as an interior designer, but you turned it down because Bill wanted you to keep acting. 
And when you were first dating Roger Perry, you turned down the lead in a Broadway play because he didn't want you to go to New York. Why do you think these men had so much control over you, Joyce? Oh, isn't that awful? I know it's very bad. That, but that happened, Roger happened uh, when we were dating in 1967 after Jimmy and I were divorced. That's when he didn't want me to go. And again, I don't know. I don't know where that comes from, a lack of, it, it comes from being codependent and doing things that other people want you to do that only benefit you, them, and not you. And that's what I tried to get across in the book. And by the time Roger and I got together, thank God, in 2000, he had been sober for four years. Otherwise, it wouldn't have worked out because I had learned too much. Well, now, although the book is called My Four Hollywood Husbands, you were actually married five times, and your fourth marriage was to a non-celebrity named Glade Hansen, who was, and you described him, an unpredictable, moody, control freak. But that marriage only lasted a year, right? Not even a year, two months. <laughs> Let's see, March, uh, it was St. Patrick's Day, I said, I, I can't do this. I had learned, but I, I fell into that trap. And then I, I learned quickly. I didn't stay for seven years, nine years, 20 years to figure it out. You know, I, I knew then that I was on the wrong path. Well, Joyce, one of the things I really admire about you so much is that although you were never an alcoholic, you went to the Betty Ford Clinic and to a treatment center called Cottonwood in Arizona to address your own emotional health. Can you yeah. tell us a bit about that, Joyce? Oh God, it's so difficult, but it's so, it's so necessary to learn about what I contributed to the breakup of these marriages and bringing children into an abusive situation. And that's, I think, more than anything, that's what I wanted the book to convey was you have children and, and be careful who you choose and who, whom you choose to have children with. And the hardest thing for me to do at Cottonwood, one day in a small group, we had to write a letter to forgive ourselves to ourselves. That was the hardest thing I ever had to do and to read it to the group because I feel great sadness that I put my children through the things I put them through. Well, I think by writing the book and helping so many other people, you have forgiven yourself. And I think that that must have been very therapeutic for you. It was, but it still worries me. <laughs> it does. It does. I mean, that doesn't go away because I, I can see the hurt my children are just wonderful. I'm so blessed every day. I thank God for my children, all of them, including the ones I didn't birth, but they are all good, kind, giving, understanding children. And, and maybe that comes from having gone through what they had to go through. I, if I can look at it that way, I'll feel better. <laughs> Well, I think that's a very reasonable and healthy way to look at it because we do learn lessons from our parents. Absolutely. And those lessons you taught them through your choices probably have helped them make better choices in their own lives. Well, they seem to have. No, luckily. <laughs> now, in 2002, you married another famous actor, Roger Perry, who you had been in love with for 35 years. He was the only husband who was able to conquer his drinking problem. And you were together until he died in 2018. Am I correct, Joyce, that this was by far your happiest relationship? Oh, yes. I, I was, uh, you know, somebody said, once you've had the best, why do you want the rest? <laughs> he, we were just so connected spiritually and uh, professionally and... Uh, and emotionally emotionally I mean it was I was so blessed so blessed every day I mean we would look at each other before we had meals and we'd hold hands and say thank you God for this miracle well and nobody deserved it more than the two of you because that was a romance that had gone on for so many years romance and of the heart <laughs> yes now I want to ask you about dyslexia you discovered as an adult that you were dyslexic 
And you wrote a musical called Gifts of Greatness, starring Ed Asner, Patty Duke, and Julie Harris, about the lives of famous people who were dyslexic. You directed the stage version, and Bill Asher directed the video. You must be very, very proud of that, Joyce. I am so proud of that. I'm proud of that. And I'm proud. I did another one called Different Heroes, Different Dreams. And Helen Hayes was in that too. And a lot of Hollywood people. And I would put the Hollywood people in with the dyslexic children. So it wouldn't be like a school play. It would been, and I would try with the musical to, to teach people what dyslexia was without seeing talking heads, you know, just say the, uh, professors and teachers. And it's still important. I think that's going to be the next book I'm going to work on. I've been trying to figure out, I had three ideas of books. One was about helping Roger make his transition and, and the way that the way you can do that and, and, and make your transition to spirit into spirit in an easier way. And the other book was going to be about my spiritual journeys as from a child till now or the other one was going to be about dyslexia and I have all these letters from dyslexic children when I spoke all across the United States they wrote letters in their dyslexic handwriting about how painful it was and I started reading those letters and I said I think this is the book I need to write. I think you should write all three. Oh aren't you sweet. <laughs> The one that resonates with me personally of all the three books that you mentioned mm -hmm. is the one about helping Roger transition into the spirit world. I think that is a book, that's a story that needs to be told. And something tells me on a spiritual level that you're the one to tell it. That's very kind. I, I did start working on it and it was very difficult about a year and a half ago. And it was pretty emotional to relive certain moments. So I'll go back some, I gave it to one person to look at and they said, this is a good outline. <laughs> and I said, okay, I, I guess I can fill it in. I've got, you know, with, it's very hard. It's pretty emotional stuff. It is, but I think he will help you when you're in the right frame of mind, you will channel a lot of advice from him. You'll see what I mean. I, I understand what you mean. I want to read you something, Joyce, that you wrote in the book. You said, I don't think you can ever make another person happy or feel loved. They have to want to be happy. Joyce, do you think you had what they call a rescue personality? I, I guess that's a good term for it. Yes. I mean, I, I don't like to see people be unhappy. I want to... I want everybody to be happy. I, every day when I say my prayers and my thankfulness, I, I try to throw out joy, love, patience, kindness, understanding out into the world. We need it. I, I was in the store the other day and I needed hearing aid batteries. And I said, you don't have any hearing aid batteries. And the checker said, we don't have a lot of things. And I said, yeah, we're lacking in a lot, aren't we? Especially kindness. <laughs> Wow. Good for you. Good for you. Well, you know, Joyce, you have not had an easy life, especially your childhood. And I really hope people will read the book and understand your evolution. But the fact that you've wanted your whole life to please other people, and then you finally came into your own, is an incredible lesson for all of us. It's really a book that I think everyone should read. That is so kind of you. Thank you. And you know, Joyce, when I read your book, I was amazed at the very full life that you've lived. I want you to just listen to some of these highlights that I'm going to remind you of. You drove cross country and traveled through Europe with Helen Hayes. You've met the greatest Hollywood legends, including Joan Crawford, Jimmy Stewart, and Ginger Rogers. You listened to Lee Strasberg talk about his adventures in the Yiddish theater. You had an audience with the Pope. You danced on TV with Fred Astaire, and you had a very dear friendship with the legendary Lillian Gish. Do you ever have to pinch yourself to believe that you actually did all that? I really do. And it's so interesting to hear it just said like that in a row. I, I'm, I am in awe and in gratefulness. That's all I can say of, of my life. It's been 
It's been the best. And any time that uh, God is ready to take me to see Roger, I'm ready. <laughs> I hope it's not too soon because I think there's three more books in you. Oh boy, I got to get going. <laughs> and that means I want you back on this show three more times to talk about those books, you know. Oh, thank you, Harvey. Thank you. <laughs> what a dear man you are. Well, Ms. Joyce Bullifant, I have so enjoyed our time together reminiscing about your amazing life and career. I hope everybody watching will read your book because there are so many life lessons in it. And it's also so entertaining. Thank you so much, Joyce, for writing the book and for taking the time to come on our show. Thank you, Harvey. What a lovely interview. Thank you so much for inviting me on your show because you are a really good interviewer. You certainly did your homework. And you made me feel good about myself. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it was easy to do. You are such a pleasure. I feel like I made a new friend. Oh, you did. Definitely. Thank you. Our guest has been the wonderful actress and author, Joyce Bullifant. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.